Hello, everyone, and welcome to Rallying Ally Stakeholders, a digital accessibility project planning. Uh, sharing this information with you are Lily Compton and Kristen Terrell from Iowa State University's Graduate College. My name is GW Swikord, and I'll be your moderator for the next 45 minutes. A quick reminder before we begin, during the presentation portion, please keep your audio and video muted unless you are presenting or you are asked to participate by the moderator or speaker. You may use the chat to ask questions, which will be addressed during the Q&A portion. Please also note that sessions will be recorded and available from USEDDA's private server shortly after the conference. The videos will be edited and posted for public availability on the USCTDA YouTube channel by the end of December 2023. Thank you all for joining us. And now I'll turn it over to Lily and Kristen. Thank you, GW. So as Kristen is pulling up our PowerPoint, let me start by introducing myself. I am Lily Compton, and I am the Assistant Director for Programming at the Center for Communication Excellence, and we are housed in the Graduate College. So um, after our first workshop session today, I'm sure that um, many of you have some um, level of uh, introduction to accessibility, digital accessibility, and how it impacts um, ETDs, electronic thesis and dissertations. So following that session today, what we're going to look at is how we go about um, rallying our stakeholders in um, dealing with the issue of uh, digital accessibility when it comes to ETDs. Um, in the past, um, in the past few conference that I've attended um, at the US ETDA, I have seen how different we are in terms of whether we are an office of one or an office of many, or we are located in the, the library as opposed to the IT or the grad college and other units. So the question becomes, um, who is in charge of this issue of digital accessibility? Um, to give a bit of background, at Iowa State, um, the thesis and dissertation review falls under the graduate college. And what's done through the ETDA admin um, through ProQuest, um, we utilize the platform. And when once it's approved and delivered to ProQuest, it is then delivered to the library, to the institutional repository. So that's where we are at Iowa State now. <clears throat> Um, when it comes to digital accessibility, we were told in 2022 that by July 2026, we would have to implement fully the digital accessibility mandate. When I saw that in 2022, I'm like, what the heck are we going to do with all our ETDs? You know, we have been reviewing for formatting and so forth, but this is a complete new um, thing on the agenda. None of us are trained. Where do we even begin? And so that became a huge concern. And last year when we were at the US ETDA, we started talking about digital accessibility. And I realized that some of us have more resources than others. And so as Kristen and I started working on our project at Iowa State, we said, okay, what if we started planning to track our journey so that um, everyone can utilize this um, open educational resource that we prepare so the information is there to uh, assist anyone who wants to take on this project, however small or big, whether it's a, a, a required mandate or just to an improvement. Um, so this is where we are coming in. So. To move on, I'm going to let Kristen introduce herself and um, begin the few, first few slides of the PowerPoint. Thanks, Lily. Lily, can you say yes if you can hear me just fine? Yep. You can, great. Um, well, it's nice to meet everybody. Um, this interface is a little bit odd, so I actually can't see the presentation or the chat right now. So um, I'm gonna be relying on Lily to jump in if there's a question that I need to address. Um, but like Lily was saying, this presentation is all about 
what we at Iowa State are going to be doing relative to digital accessibility and our electronic theses and dissertations, um, and hopefully ways that we can document that so that others can see what we're doing and share those ideas. Um, and, and that's what we're trying to source with our presentation today. So um, I hope that most of the people listening right now went to the session this morning, which was so incredible to have so many people learning about implementing digital accessibility features in Microsoft Word and Adobe. Um, and ultimately that is, is, is what these digital accessibility mandates do is they necessitate that we get new knowledge. They necessitate that we implement new policies and establish procedures as electronic thesis and dissertation administrators. Um, so our policy at Iowa State University links to um, a law called Section 508, which is a portion of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So Iowa State University is obviously in the United States, and so we need to comply with the US laws, and that's where the Section 508 comes from. Um, Section 508 says that um, any federally funded um, electronic technology has to be accessible according to the standard of WCAG, that WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So those are the standards and the law is Section 508. And then another abbreviation that I used here in the title and in the title of this slide is this A11Y, which is a numeronym. You've heard of acronyms and you probably don't like those because they're hard to understand if you're not familiar with them. Well, now get ready for numeronyms, which are acronyms with numbers in them. So the A11Y numeronym, the 11 stands for the 11 letters between the A and the Y in accessibility. Um, and it's sometimes pronounced ally. Um, so that, you know, evokes the idea of being an ally for people with disabilities and users with disabilities. So that is a really common numeronym, um, especially if you're online. Um, if you want to learn more about digital accessibility on Twitter or LinkedIn, that A11Y numeronym is going to be a great place to start from. So you might want to take note of that. Um, and then again, Getting back to Lily's point um, about what we're doing at Iowa State University, the need um, to develop new knowledge policies and procedures has provided us with a rationale to develop an open educational resource for electronic thesis and dis dissertation administrators who are adopting digital accessibility. Um, and if you're not familiar with open educational resources, they are these wonderful things things because they're free and they're created by educators for the purpose of educating um, and they're they're very easy to get a hold of. So the idea is that we're going to create this ebook that will be freely available. It's the target audience is electronic thesis and dissertation administrators who are adopting digital accessibility and our goal is to essentially put into a more permanent space resources like the presentation this morning so that ETD administrators can easily go back and say, oh my gosh, I remember there was something in this, in this demonstration about using Microsoft Word to create tagged headings in my document. You know, how do I do that? Or how do I teach a student to do that? Hopefully this OER is gonna be a wonderful resource for those kinds of needs. So the title of our OER is Addressing the Digital Accessibility Mandate for Dissertations, Theses, and Creative Components, Tracking Our Journey. So we are actively um, implementing digital accessibility in our ETD program. And so we're hoping that we can have this OER ready and accessible for everybody by December 2024. So that's next December. We're being ambitious here to put together a book, um, but it's something that we're going to be doing anyway. So the idea is we're just going to put it into a book so that 
you know, we can remember what we did and you guys can all see what we did. Some of the content that this book is going to contain is digital accessibility policy, how to meet digital accessibility standards in theses, dissertations, and creative components. And then I noticed in the chat during the earlier session, um, some people were saying, you know, we're getting a lot of pushback from students, from faculty. Why do we need to do these format requirements? We're going to include an FAQ for all of these stakeholders in our open educational resources. So one for faculty, one for students, one for administrators. So if they're asking you, why do I have to do alt text? You can refer them to our FAQ. And with the open educational resources, another cool thing about them is that they're Creative Commons licensed, which means that not only is it free for you to read the book, but you can actually take content out of it and put it onto your own website. Um, you can also change it. So it's it's a little bit of a looser copyright um, with the Creative Commons license. And so we're really hoping that this tool becomes something that you can make it work for your needs at your institution. Um, we're also gonna talk about conducting an audit, um, essentially just taking stock of who your stakeholders are, what kind of software you might have, what kind of templates are gonna be affected, um, and, and just other things that go on with your, um, with your program that you need to consider when you're doing digital accessibility. And then also a checklist for um, ETD administrators. Why are we doing a roundtable related to this? It is partly to just let you know that it's going to be out there, but we also want your input on what's going into this. OER so that it can be more useful for you. So the purpose of today's presentation is to understand broader perspectives by eliciting input from you um, and to get a sense of what's going on at your various institutions. The outcome of today's session is that your input, we are going to review it and synthesize it to inform the content of our OER. And our aim is to make it more relevant to you so that you're not just reading about what Iowa State University did and thinking, OK, good for you. That's not going to work at my institution because it's a totally different kind of space. We understand that and we don't want it to be a limited OER that's you know only good for, for Iowa State University. We want it to be useful beyond. So we're hoping that your input today can help us get that visibility and make our we are more useful. Um, I just want to note that we're going to be collecting information today and we do want to acknowledge contributors in the OER. So if you provide this information, we will attribute your full name, your title, and your institutional affiliation um, in the OER. We won't list your email address. If you wish not to be acknowledged as a contributor, please do note that. Um, so we're going to be using a Padlet to collect input from you today. And there's one section of the Padlet is called Acknowledgement and Follow-up. And when you write your um, information, you can add the note that says follow-up only. And so that way we'll have your email address. And when we're, when we're ready to distribute this open educational resource, we will notify you and then you can access it, but your name won't be in it. So our goal is basically we want to give you credit, but we don't want to get you in trouble. So if you don't want your name in the book, just let us know by using that follow up only note on your attribution. Um, the agenda for this round table is I'm going to give you a couple of more slides. Each one has a prompt and a link to our input web page, which is called Padlet. Um, for each prompt, I'm going to give you three to four minutes so that you can write your thoughts in the Padlet. And then after all three sessions, we are actually going to come back together so that we can discuss um, synchronously, collectively. We can have more of a, a back and forth um, talk about what people are entering into that Padlet. So let's go ahead and get started. And I'm going to hand the... Um, virtual microphone back over to my colleague, Lily. Great, thank you. And before we even begin this next part, um, I see a question from GW. Have you thought of doing a workflow survey to look for systems different to yours, but used mul by multiple other institutions? Yes. And so this is not something that we've begun doing, but then we are trying to identify our 
internal workflow, right? Who we work with, um, who is responsible? Because is it the IR um, responsibility or is it the grad college, right? Those are all conversations we are planning and we will track all of those information in our OER. But we also want today's session to be a collective discussion amongst everybody. And what um, Kristen was saying, we're gonna be using this platform called um, the Padlet. And I'm going to give everybody a chance to type in um, row by row, right? So we're gonna look at resources, then we're gonna look at auditing, and then we're gonna look at stakeholders. For each of these um, sections, there are a few prompts already on Padlet. And I will give everybody a chance to type where they think they want to respond to. And um, in about like three minutes time, I will say, okay, um, we're coming down to the end of the time for this prompt, we're gonna move on. So we're gonna do some collective writing for the next um, 10 minutes or so. And the final part of this um, discussion uh, panel or this round table will be that we will review everything together on this Padlet and then open it up to um, more talk about what was written, uh, more concerns, more questions, more elaborations and so forth. So if you want to go ahead and um, open up, Kristen, can you copy the tiny URL into the uh, chat box so that people can just click on it? So once the link is there, um, you can click on the link and go to Padlet and you will see the first row of prompts are under the header resources. So the first question is, what resources do you need for the four areas? Um, and then you would just type your comment um, at the bottom. If you have a Padlet account, you can sign in and it would uh, list your names. If not, you might just be listed as anonymous, that's okay or you can type your name first and enter your comment, right? The second prompt there is what resources do students need? Um, one of the things from the first uh, session today was like, okay, if we're using Adobe to remediate our files, that means we need the Adobe Pro, right? So does your university provide that to your students? Okay, what others? So. What might be the cost of uh, resources covered? So, you know, at your institution, what, what do you know? What do we need to say to our administrators if we say, I need somebody to check digital accessibilities for ETDs, what do I need? What is the cost? What are the direct costs? What are the indirect costs? Have you thought about that? Um, and then the, the, the last question, the last prompt for each section is always like, what else would you explore? So without much uh, ado, I hand this all to you all. For the next three minutes, would you take a look at the first four prompts under resources and go ahead and type your comments. And if you have any questions about any of the prompts, you can type it in the chat here or just type it directly into the uh, Padlet um, and say, you know, I'm not sure about this or do you mean this? Or I think, you know, this, this and that, right?
I'll give everyone 30 more seconds to finish up and I can see already there's a theme going on and it's, you know, it's really common questions and issues that we have. So please keep going, um, keep adding to it. Um, I will note that buy-in is definitely um, an important issue. And then also manpower, like how do you get more money to pay for all these things in the first session, we talked about some places that have copy editors. Well, can the copy editor do digital accessibility? No, because it's different skill sets. So do you hire somebody to fulfill that? How many files do you do? How much will it cost and so forth, right? Um, and then you talk about um, software and you talk about training resources. Sure, training resources are excellent who is going to be the one creating those training materials? Who is going to do the uh, um, actual outreach and so forth? So those are all very important issues. Uh, Kristen, could you move on to the next slide? We will now move on to the next question. And it also obviously, oh, um, yeah. Sorry, auditing. it should have been auditing. So okay, then. yeah. So auditing, um, can you share how you would start today, right? Some of you have already started. Some of you have not. Some of you are just one person in an office uh, and you're in your own world. You don't really know who you answer to. You don't really know who would be in charge of this. How would you start in those, that case? Or in our case, where we have some responsibility for compliance, but we have to talk to the dean, we have to talk to the library, how would we start this? So this is our way of figuring out where we go from our journey, where would you go, right? And then what other stuff you already have on your campus? So auditing. give everyone 30 more seconds to just kind of put in more ideas and we'll leave this Padlet up too. So later we can go back here to um, add in um, after or while we're doing the round table discussion, but let's move on to the next slide, which is stakeholders, right? And I think there are more commonalities here um, so who are the stakeholders on your campus? Who has the final say in the compliance? Um, what resources are available and who controls the resource and or funding?
Last 30 seconds, and then those who have finished the stakeholder, if you would like to proceed to the next section where I don't think we have a slide for that, but it's like additional questions or suggestions, please go ahead and put it right there. Um, we want your ideas. We want your questions. These are the things that we will try to incorporate into our OER so that, um, you know, it's useful for everybody here and, you know, whoever takes on this position in the future and gets thrown into this concept called digital accessibility. Um, we want this to be a helpful resource. And then obviously the last section is, you know, please add your name um, if you want to be listed in our OER as a contributor. All these great um, responses, we're going to synthesize it and we're going to pose questions in our OER, like a, a list of things that you guys have shared, right? So then hopefully you can bring this OER to your administrator and says, hey, take a look at this FAQ here. That's why we need money, right? Or this is, uh, this is not just me saying it, you know, look at all the people who have um, mentioned all the challenges we are feeling. It's not just me, it's everybody on campus who's going to be impacted. So thank you very much for all your contributions. And we will continue to look at this um, even after today's um, session. So we will leave this up. If you have more input, please continue to put your responses in. Now, uh, we have the last 15 minutes that we want to open up to the roundtable discussions. And I think here's how we're going to do this, right? Um, I think if we open it up to the audience to speak, we may have uh, many people trying to speak at the same time. So let's go question by question um, what you would like to see more of, what you see in the Padlet as a theme that's coming up. Or if you have a question for us, you can put it in the chat here. GW, Kristen, and myself will try to look and moderate the, uh, the, the chat and maybe call on uh, specific people who have responded in Padlet to elaborate. Will that work, GW? That works for me. Okay. So let's take a look at the resources. Let's look thematically what jumps out at you um, in terms of similarities of concerns, challenges. Um, I can see faculty buying is very important, right? So how can we convince faculty that this is necessary? At Iowa State, when we have a mandate in 2026, they have no choice, right? But at the same time, we also don't want the faculty to be responsible for both content and formatting of their students' thesis and dissertations. So how do we provide them with uh, consideration so that they have a buy-in, right? Do we have a workflow to train their students? How do we communicate to the faculty? They need to reach out to specific units on campus who are in charge of um, assisting their students to learn what digital accessibility requirements are. Um, what resources do you need? I think one of the important things also is templates, right? And I remember about two or three years ago at the US ETDA, we were talking about formatting and somebody said, our dean does not believe in formatting guidelines. Um, as long as they have done their work, we just push that through. That's great. At that point, you know, it wasn't an issue, but for us, we've always had this template to kind of standardize, to standardize um, what it looks like to, to uh, kind of preserve some uh, professionalism there. It really helps to have a template that we can continue to work on. So what if, what is your situation at your university? Do you have a template already? If you don't, are you going to start from scratch or would you like to come to this OER and look at all the different institutions who have 
some kind of um, template. John was uh, showing uh, links to his template. We also have links. I'm sure a lot of you have templates. You know, if you have those templates, please add that to the Padlet as well. And we will, inter um, you know, integrate that so that the OER is not just about Iowa State. It's going to be a resource resource repository. I'm going to stop talking. Anyone here would like, like to type in more of the findings from this Padlet on the resources? Thematically, type that in. What's the one keyword you see that goes across multiple responses? More training. Okay, somebody was asking who is stakeholders? So by stakeholders, we are referring to who gets impacted by something called digital accessibility. So I think in terms of Iowa State, we believe that the stakeholders are the students themselves who produce the ETDs. We believe that our grad college is a stakeholders because we review the final formatting and approve it. We believe that the uh, library is a stakeholders because they are the final resting place of this digital uh, thesis and dissertation. So anything past the approval stage like remediation and so forth, they are in charge of. Um, we believe that faculty would be um, key stakeholders because they are the ones who need to understand during the writing phase that the students have to deal with this as well as the content. So. There was a question about turnaround time, right? We need more turnaround. Workflow, looking at workflow, like GW says, what is the workflow? At this point, um, I think, was it Kim or Terry who said, it takes about three hours before the digital accessibility for one file. And if the final um, process is two weeks before the deadline, how are we going to deal with all those accessibility issues when we have to return the files? and they have to fix the files, but they don't know how to fix the files and so forth. So that's also a stakeholder. Who else on campus? And I see um, stakeholders are also maybe somebody like the provost, right? Because we need money and money is a big theme here. Money, how do we pay for it? How do we staff it? Who do we go to for money? We can't keep going to the grad college dean here at our place and saying, we need one more staff, but we do, right? Because just to just to look at one file is three hours and Iowa State looks at 650 files per year. And we're not even considering the 160 or com creative components that will be um, also required uh, to be accessible. So somebody was saying, yes, hire a digital ETDA accessibility coordinator. Great idea. Who pays for it, right? Who do we convince that we need this person? The dean, the provost, the library, the grad college, um, the faculty, the colleges, you know, those are all questions that we have to navigate. And we can't just say, you're responsible. <laughs> so I think that's where the question about stakeholders come in. Who do, who do we contact? Who do we bring to the table to talk about this? And everybody's tight on budget, right? Where do we find this money? Iowa State's been uh, cut on budget by the Board of Regents every year for the last, I don't know, 10 years. So everything's been cut. Now we have this federal mandate. Let's take a look again at what all the other uh, things on um, in chat. Oh, I like Larry's one. How do we keep students from revolting against any extra work or responsibility for these functions? Yes. How do we pass that responsibility to them? We can't just give them the full burden, right? We still have to give them resources. So for example, Adobe Acrobat Pro is one of the biggest thing. We give them licenses now. Some universities may not have that opportunity so I feel like one of the solution is Kim, who says Adobe Acrobat Pro has a seven day trial. This I've heard this perfect solution. 
you try to help the students go through this last week, sign up for the trial, help them through this, um, this digital accessibility check and deal with that during that one week. Other, otherwise, then they have to bear the cost of uh, $19.99 per month. I have also heard of solutions where the library or the grad college could um, open up a couple of computer lab, um, you know, computer desktops that have the that has those licenses, so students can come in and work on those documents um, at any given time when the the computers are available. So that's another solution. What other thoughts do you have about? Um, auditing how would you start if we were to say today your dean or your provost said to you okay we need to make our etds uh digitally accessible and now since you're the reviewer you're in charge for um figuring out what we need to do so where would you begin um, obviously for us we start looking at our templates we we'll start looking at all our instructional materials that we have created. How are we going to work on updating those to um, meet the accessibility templates? Um, and it takes a lot of time to recreate all the instructional materials that we have. What's your timeline? We have, we have up till 2026, but we started working on this issue last year. And we are going to move forward with hopefully launching a, a soft launch of a new digital template next year and giving ourselves a one year grace period to address all the kinks uh, and the transitions between those students using the old template and the new template. We need time to train our um, grad student consultants and Kristen is educating herself it takes time, it takes professional development funding. At your institution, do you know who you can go to for help? Um, can we uh, decide, you know, can we provide you information on who you can start uh, checking up with? Larry was asking, who set the 2026 deadline? I think it was just the university uh, administrators and then a policy came out and uh, we do have a digital accessibility office that started putting um, information out for everybody. So we have one year kind of like to audit all the stuff. A lot of those things deal with WCAG stuff, right? A lot of website stuff and so forth. But when I saw that, I was thinking to myself, well, sure, it's all good. WCAG is not my concern. It's going to be somebody else who's dealing with the grad college website that needs, needs to learn what digital accessibility means. But then I said, hang on, I am the ETD compliance person. So that falls on my lap to make sure that our ETDs are ready, right? So. I would challenge you to say, this is gonna be somebody else who's gonna tell me what to do when it comes, but it doesn't work like that. We can't, if I wait until 2026 for somebody to say, hey, why is your, why is your ETD process not looking at digital accessibility? You know, we are three years behind getting ready for it, right? So take a look on your campus. Do you have a policy? If not, you can start small, right? Like what uh, Terry was saying, if you even just have one takeaway from this morning's workshop, what can you do? Maybe it is a matter of looking at all our templates uh, of the institutions that have templates and then adopting it and asking like, hey, can we use your template, right? There's That's a start. Four minutes left. Let's take a look at the stakeholders. Um, thank you, GW. So again, the... Um, Stakeholders, I think we've identified a lot of common people, um, the grad college, the library, the provost. Um, yeah, I see the board of regents, yes. Um, Office of Accessibility. Um, do I see any other ones? Um, general counsel, yes, Kim, general counsel is important. Uh, legal affairs or digital innovation, 
uh, dissertation writer workshops is something that we want to implement. So um, I think that when it comes to stakeholders, we have a clearer sense of who the stakeholders are. And um, definitely we have to address those and make a case for asking for funding, asking for, hey, I don't want to be caught off guard. Some institutions have this mandate already. Our institution does not. But, you know, we may need to start looking into this to prepare for the future. Or is our institution going to go in the same direction? Um, so those are all the things that are on our minds. And we really want to thank you for your input here today. Again, like I said, our Padlet is going to be kept up for a little bit longer. So if you want to keep asking your questions, uh, add your suggestions, provide us with resources that we can add to the OER, we would re really appreciate it. And we will definitely follow up um, along the way. Thank you. GW, over to you. Is GW here to close the session or shall I just close this? Um, and I think we leave it open for people who want to loiter and discuss. Okay, we will be here, Kristen and I. So feel free to ask your questions um, in the chat still. Um, there's a question about automating uh, thesis deposit system. And I think that was kind of what uh, Allison was talking about this morning, um, ProQuest is looking at integrating that um, as a service. You know, I think it would be a subscribe service. If you don't have um, the capacity to do so, then perhaps your institution would just pay a subscription cost to have their, um, you know, checks done through ProQuest or whatever automated system you can have in your um in your institution so i was thinking somebody was talking about um the canvas being able to do that we have a later presentation today talking about canvas as a an asynchronous uh check so tune into that one um as well so i could see that as a possibility of a first round of digital accessibility checking um, Thank you everyone for um, your appreciation and we really are excited to share um, our OER with you so that um, we can at least help some of you with a starting point. And also it really helps us in five years and 10 years from now, somebody who comes and say, who gave you authority? The pushbox, the pushbacks from faculty, obviously, is not something surprising. So, the you know who who gave you authority to change this, and so we can look at uh, this OER and say this was the process that we went through. This was why we went through it. This was who we asked for input. It's not just us at Iowa State. It's this USETDA who uh, comprise of all key stakeholders across the United States and beyond who are interested, invested in this issue. We have a question, other than ProQuest, Adobe and Windows, are there any commercially available programs um, that will look at digital accessibility? I do not know any of any. At Iowa State, we deal with ProQuest and we have templates in Word and uh, LaTeX through um, Overly, so those are our primary um, 
technological software, but I open this up to everyone else who may have ideas. I know John maybe was talking about um, another software somebody was using instead of Overleaf. So I know of one and I can't remember the name of it, um, but it's a, it's a free download and all it does is um, check it doesn't fix, but it's more comprehensive than the Adobe Acrobat Accessibility Checker. And then um, Kim just typed in the chat, Foxit, which is something I haven't heard of. Um, so Kim, maybe you can tell us what that does. We don't use it here at BGSU. I just know there are some schools in Ohio that use Foxit. Um, so it does check your PDF. Um, I do know that if you're paying companies to look at these, it's $5 a page to remediate a PDF. <clears throat> it's pretty pricey. And I will add that um, it is a common um, finding that remediation at the level of uh, the repository is going to be way more expensive than trying to help your students, the authors, um, prepare most of these um, files ahead of time so that the remediation cost is lowered. And I think for me anyway, I think that is a big um, motivation to get stakeholders on board, right? We go to the library and say, hey, you know, the ultimate place our ETDs appear on is the institutional repository. Um, how can we reduce the cost of remediation? Can you help us with the process or the workflow of helping students prepare uh, compliant files before they are approved by the grad college and delivered to the institutional repository. 